Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. We're, uh, this is the Finance and Planning Committee meeting, June 16th. Um, as you can tell, we have people in the audience that we nor normally don't have. Uh, that's because we have an issue uh, that we need to address today. And uh, that issue is uh, the request of the board uh, for a recommendation on the uh, existing Discovery Center lease at the East Gate. And so what we'll, uh, we'll do is early in the, the agenda, we'll have a presentation from uh, Kevin and uh, from the landlord, and then we will have the opportunity to discuss and debate it as we wish. And, uh, determine whether we we want to make a recommendation to the board or not and what that recommendation hmm. might be okay. understanding this is the first time we've seen this right first few minutes yes 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 um, so we're uh, and, and in fact uh, Morris you haven't seen any of this nobody has seen any of this information before okay. So uh, this will be the first time everybody sees it. Okay. All right. Um, first, introduction of a uh, new committee member. Karina Federhoff is the uh, the new controller for the POA. Uh, Karina has been uh, the county <coughs> manager. Uh, or, is that right? County yes. manager uh, at the POA uh, for the last. Almost two years. Almost two years. And she has a, a great background, has uh, served as controller for a bank previously, and uh, has been uh, running most of the day-to-day -day operations of the finance operation at uh, the POA uh, since she got here. So she is uh, uh, new in place as of the past 36 hours. And, uh, and so it's a bit of fun experience. So, yeah. feel, feel free to ask her any questions you might have. Thank you. You spell your name with a K or C? C O R E E N A. And your last name, Corinne? Okay, just, are you, I'm not even going to, F is in Frank, E T T E R H O, F is in Frank, F is in Frank. Better off. I asked that right for you, Kathy. I asked that for you, Kathy. I appreciate it. Okay. The uh, we also have John Paul here today, uh, who's the interim manager for the POA, and we have a number of people behind us. I'm asked them to introduce themselves. Susan Birmingham, um, uh, my husband and I are the new owners of La Plaza and the Cordova Center. Jim Birmingham, husband to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Most importantly, <laughs> 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 okay. Jamie Caperton, Chief Member Experience Officer here at the Village. Okay. And I'm Kevin Sexton, the Director of Tourism and Community Affairs. Okay. So, um, we have the minutes from the last meeting that I think were emailed to you. I hope they were, but uh, I gave I you a motion we approve the minutes. Okay. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Kevin, I've been told that if you stand over there. This is the sweet spot, right? It, it's That's the, the sweet spot, spot right there? Yeah. The <laughs> sheltered right. spot. All right. It, All right. The camera picks you up and, and you can still see it. And the microphone's picking you up. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Close enough for government work. All right. Am I ready to roll? Yep. All right. Congratulations to you, Karina. You. Karina's been really good to me. She helps me with the 50th anniversary merchandise. And so we, we worked well together. But again, good afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for, for this opportunity today. I really appreciate it. I also want to thank each of you for the service that you were providing and the leadership to our community. 
I can tell you from, from our small staff at the Discovery Center that we are very passionate about this community and we're, we're committed to you. Today is a, is, is a big decision. It's a big decision we need to make and I can be the first one to tell you that I don't have all the answers, but what I want to do today is just talk to you about some of the background, give you some of our processes, just give you some insight to the Discovery Center and what we do. Before I start making my comments, I have an interesting question. How many of you have been to the Discovery Center or when it was Village Homes and Land? Who has been in there? Ooh. Nobody. That's what I anticipated. Well, what about the one that was in Hot Springs? Well, and the it, former it, it, one at the West Gate. Exactly. I've been to each of those. All right. So, would it be permissible for me to stand right there and just scroll through a couple of pictures? I took a couple of pictures of, of the Discovery Center. Uh, yeah, so can you somewhat see that? Yeah. yeah. As you walk in, this is the space over to the right-hand side. You can see that we have our, our, our banner with our real estate partner program. You'll hear me talking about that. If you look at this little bookcase right here, you take to the, and we have this wide open space that's over here. Everybody can see that? Okay. This is the very front of the office as you, as you walk in. It's a nice space. See that? Mm -hmm. Right over here in this glass area, well, there, here's also our front seating area. Very modern, up to date. This is our little conference room. This is where I've been sitting host about five, six people. This just gives you, this doesn't do it justice, but it gives you a little bit of a perspective of, <clears throat> of what our Discovery Center looks like. And I encourage you and I invite you to, to come out and see it. It's, it's just down the road, everybody. You know, where, you know where it's at, right? You've seen the signage. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I want to do is just very quickly give you a little bit of a background. As Kathy mentioned, the the Discovery Center started in 2016 in downtown Hot Springs. Did y'all ever, did, did y'all visit that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That was established before my arrival. I've been on board since January of 2018. Once I realized that the Discovery Center in Hot Springs was not, it was attached to the Arlington Hotel. Once I realized that that space was not generating traffic, which is, so I've been there, I understand what we're talking about. It just generate, didn't generate enough traffic. One of the things that I did immediately was to get a sublease, and I worked with CHI St. Vincent's to get that done to move, to move our Discovery Center. So when that happened, and that happened in late 18, sometime in 18, we incorporated the Discovery Center into the Village Homes and Land Office that is where the Discovery Center is now. With me? Mm -hmm. All right. If you'll recall, Village Homes and Land was active until the very end of 2019. Cheryl Dunson was the broker at Village Homes and Land and she turned in her resignation in October but by legal. We were open until the end of the year 2019. In January of this year is when I moved, I was at the POA for two years. I was at the POA office. That's when I moved my office from there to the Discovery Center. Okay? And that is literally the moment when I started traveling for this year. I went to Chicago to Ideal Living, went to, uh, went to Los Angeles for travel and adventures, and went to a golf show with her in Dallas. Um, just to give you a brief description of our, some of our processes that we have down at the Discovery Center, first and foremost, we are ser we are the, we're serving as a customer service center for the east side. This is an opportunity to give that very first impression factor for all the visitors that are coming in from the east side. The Discovery Center is home to our Discovery Package Program. Have you guys heard of our Discovery Packages and the different ones that we have? Thank goodness that COVID has lightened up. We've had 
two or three packages in the last two or three weeks. July is going to be extremely busy. In fact, our next discovery package is going to be taking advantage of our uh, RV park. We have three people at the Discovery Center. We have myself, we have a full-time employee, and we have a part-time employee. And our part-time employee was the, was the manager at the Discovery Center in downtown Hot Springs. Um, so this is the space also where we compile all of our leads for the, for the newly developed real estate partner program. <laughs> this was after the closure of Village Homes and Land. So, Late last year, we developed, actually the brokers developed this partnership with us, the real estate partner program. All seven firms are involved in the program. Uh, and we, whether leads come in through the website or I go to a show or however they can walk ins, those leads that we generate at the Discovery Center go to our partners in the broker program. Now I wanna make this clear to all of you. I mean. The Discovery Center is in no competition at all with our realtor partners. We are a family. We've built this program. I mean, we're there to enhance leads, build leads, and send them out to our realtor partners. And we do that by what I call is the wheel when it opened up back in, there's a rotation of leads that go out to the different firms. Does that make sense? Okay. So essentially there, there we are the front porch, the true gateway uh, for all the guests coming in from, and I want you to think about this, from the Little Rock side, from think regionally, they're coming in from Benton and Bryant and Little Rock. You know, this gives an opportunity at the Discovery Center for, for welcoming and more guests to come in so that the first person that they encounter could be potentially us and not the gate, not the security guards, right? One of the things I wanted to do later on this year was start giving some amenity tours. If, if somebody didn't want to spend time with a realtor, let me give them a tour of the amenities, a tour of the facility so that I could turn that into a lead and report that and make that a lead into the realtor, real estate partner program. Have you guys ever been to, uh, have y'all ever been to one of the Arkansas Welcome Centers, whether it be Texarkana, uh, West Memphis, Fort Smith, have y'all ever been to one of those? That's my, that's where I came from. I came from state government. I was a long time with the Department of Parks and Tourism and Economic Development. Those welcome centers are places that you can drink coffee, you can chat, you can get maps, get merchandise. It's a place to just, to gather information. And so that's kind of the vision that I have. Um, also hosting guests, that, that relationships that, we've, that I've built since I've started here. I've built relationships with businesses both in Garland and Saline County. One of the main relationships that, that, that we have, and in fact, I'm hosting them on Friday, is with Oakland. I'm having the new group sales manager from Oakland out here. That's a place that I can host guests at the, uh, at the Discovery Center. Just some reasonable alternative uses for the Discovery Center. What could we do to make it more viable? We can allow our real estate partner program realtors to use this space to meet with their clients, to host meetings. It's a place for community to gather. I mean, networking. I mean, if you see from the pictures, again, it doesn't do it justice. This space is set up for that kind of atmosphere. It's already there. It's done. One of the things that I want to, wanted to do was have the open house with our realtors have them come out for a couple hours and then have some time for, for the public to come out and see it. But obviously, COVID hit in mid-March and I was not able to do that. Um, start opening up on weekends. One of the things that I think we should start doing moving forward is that we can start opening up on Saturdays and Sundays and having our real estate partners actually man be in there during those hours on the weekend as guests come in. You know, one of the things that we might be able to do is have some sort of additional POA staffing. I mean, we've got a marketing team. Could somebody from marketing or golf spend some time down at the Discovery Center as we're welcoming guests in? Um, find innovative ways to drive traffic to the East Gate. What could we do to relieve some of the pressure of the gate and the security guards? Because as you roll in as a guest, Quite honestly, do they have time to chit-chat and talk about, you know, because they want information. Do they have time to do that? 
Not really. It's not that warm, welcoming experience. So if we could find innovative ways to help with boat decals, something to just drive them into the center. One of the things this reminds me of is, and Daniel, you'll appreciate this, is when my, my child was younger, I, I took her to Silver Dollar City. Well, when you go into, up to Silver Dollar City, what, is the, what do you go through first before I can enter the park? The store. Absolutely. The store. You have to go through the gift shop to buy merchandise and get information before you can go in. That's kind of the that's kind of what I'm thinking about long term in terms of the Discovery Center. Uh, let's talk about activity. And this is as of January when, when, when I moved in. You know, I moved in I, I literally the first week in January. I certainly didn't expect any traffic, foot traffic, vehicle traffic. And it was right as I was beginning to do the shows. So we got back. I put the sign down there at the Discovery Center sign. And then what happened? What happened in mid-March, y'all? COVID. COVID came. So we were open. Think about it. We were open as a Discovery Center from January to March. And ever since then, pretty much, it's been it's been very quiet because of the pandemic. I want to be clear about something to all of you. I want you to listen to me. Village homes and land was never truly set up as a visitor experience place. Does that make sense? It's a, it was a real estate office. It was an office. It was never utilized the way that it could have been. I have a different vision. I'm a different, I'm of a different department. I see bigger things. I see presence at the gate to welcome gifts. Some of the key drivers to success, in my opinion, having some sort of community real estate, family shared visitor space is vital to our guests both now and the future. I mean, Seeing how we are the largest gated community in North America spanning 26,000 acres, in my opinion, as big as we are, it warrants a welcome center, a visitor center on both sides of our gates. Thousands of people come into that east gate, both inbound and outbound, on an everyday basis. You'll notice our directional sign down there is inbound and outbound, going both ways. The future growth, the future growth both residentially and commercially, where's it going to happen, y'all? East. Where's a lot of growth going to happen in the future? East. East. east side. The key, the key is how we market it, right? The key is how we're going to market the East Gate. Social media. Web presence, digest, opening on weekends. I'm not going to steal Jamie's thunder back there, but there's a marketing campaign that's forthcoming. That's the key, right? Don't y'all agree? How much are we going to expose the place? We can offset some of our costs by, by selling creative merchandise. Make it like an Arkansas Welcome Center. We could host small community, community meetings at the visitor center. Because why would we do that? To get our property owners engaged, our residents engaged, get them in the doors. Actually, I know this is about, I know this is about return on investment. Well, you've already made that. Look at this space. Just consider it. It's, it's, it's so modern. It's one of the best facilities that the POA has. It's inviting, it's warm, it's welcoming. It has that first impression back. What about allowing our clubs and organizations to, like they do on at the west side, to put their brochures out there on the east side? One of the things that we did for the board was, was we created a position statement, and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I want to continue to 
show you the recommendations that we gave in our position statement. Change the name from the Discovery Center to the Eastgate Visitor Center. Give billboard signage on Highway 5 to direct traffic to this particular entrance. Provide weekend open hours at the location. Launch awareness program to promote real estate partner program and two available visitor center locations now available in HSV POA. Dedicate income from the uh, real estate partner program to cover operating expenses of this location. So, I mean, that's part of what the program was is we generate leads and they, they help offset some of the costs. Okay. All marketing materials will drive traffic to, to the visitor center <coughs> assistance. Has this been helpful to you, giving you a little bit of a background, some insight into, into the Discover Center? Do you have any questions or comments for me? <coughs> or can, go ahead. Yes, sir. What kind of traffic are you getting through the visitor center now? That, well, what did you get? What do you mean? January? Well, no, none. I mean, I mean between 10 and 15 people. COVID 19 in January? COVID 19 in January, we just had our. We just had, we, so far in June, we've already had 20 people. We've had people, since this has all come up, we've had residents come in there. Uh, but I'll, I'll just, to completely frank with you, we've been closed. We have not been advertising to, to come on in and visit. So yeah, it's been low since, since I moved in. It honestly has been. But do you have a target for how many you'd like to Well, see? that's a great What's your personal goal? I mean, that, how that, do we rate whether you're doing a good job or not? Well, that's, that is a great question, and that's the $64,000 question. I've thought about this over and over. How can, I possibly, how can I possibly put a number to it when I don't have any precedent, and I've never done a project of the, like this before of bringing visitors into a welcome center? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it depends on how much we put into it monetarily. What's our return going to be? How many people do need to come in to make it viable? I don't have the exact number to that. Let me help you a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> You're setting me up. No, no, I'm not. No, my, my daughter just moved here, and she went through a lot of different, um, you know, retirement centers and all this kind of thing. And she went through some really good ones, what you're trying to get to. When she went in, they actually had people in the village in those centers where she went to school, like IU, this kind of thing. And I mean, it was a group. They really did a lot of front end. I think that's what you were talking about. You really want to do a lot of that front end stuff. Well, yes, I, I that's... agree with that, you know, because we're not doing a good job with that right now. I think that you said that also. Absolutely. But I would sure like to see some kind of metrics or goals or something. I mean, vision or something. That's what. I mean, Stephanie? Well, I, I just wanted to, let me, let me just um, insert that the East Gate sees today approximately 4,000 cars a day in and out of that gate. And so if, if we were to, to do our signage properly, to, to, if our messaging is correct, and we are guiding them into that space to get their visitor card, to get their map, to have that first conversation before they hit the actual guard shack, then I, I mean, you can do the math. I mean, if, if we got a fraction of that, you could see how those numbers would multiply very, very quickly. And that's at, as of today. Well, in fact, that's as of about a year ago, was um, around 4,000 cars a day in and out of that. How many go through the West? About 13,000. And how many go into the Discovery Center? I have no idea. It's a chamber of commerce. Visitor Center. A lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, the, the, I mean, obviously, you got Sonic and Walmart and Berkshires, and it, I mean, it's very, very busy. The West Gate is obviously much busier. Um, but also, there's about 165 to 270 acres of commercial land for sale out there. Right? Well, in fact, 60 plus acres just sold recently in the, since Cooper started selling off some of their commercial property. These, these guys bought some of it. But uh, all of the land right there around the East Gate has sold recently with, um, with local developers who have plans to start developing that property quickly. So you're going to see activity out there, I would say, in the very near term. So whether you close it today and think about needing it again later, um, the need will, will probably show back up. I was just trying to understand your job a little bit. You get the people in. You give them, what do you take them next? What's your objective? You get six people in there. Do you just turn them over to somebody else? or? Well, we, after we, we, 
each each guest that comes in is, is special, and you 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 tailor have a conversation with them, and that can go in, in multiple different directions. Some of them just may want a map. Some of them may want you to, them to tell them how to get to Ponce Golf Course. If they're interested in housing, we talk about that, and then immediately in my mind, we talk about do they want to see a realtor. And if the answer to that is yes, we have the program that's in place that the realtors built in line, and so they, we would reach we would reach out to the realtor, and they would contact that guest. Are you just promoting everything in the village? Do you get in the other resources we got in the area? We got a lot of stuff in Hot Springs. We got Washita Lake with striped bass fishing I, and all of I, that. I'm a lot. I'm lifelong in this area. I've been here my entire life. I know every amenity in Arkansas in general. I was the chief community developer for AEDC, so I'm I'm not only well at selling our community. I'm a property owner, have been for ten years, but I can sell this entire state. I got a lot more, but I'll go offline with you. Somebody else can ask. <laughs> you ask a question. Is there? Okay. May I have a quick question? It's a long drive from Benton to here. Do you offer restroom facilities? Or we have. That's a great. That's another thing. What do you do when you go to the Welcome Center? I didn't want to. Now that we're on this subject, we just talk about it. What do you do when you go to the Welcome Center? Use a restroom. Right. Absolutely. We have two restrooms at our Discovery Center. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, is there any number? I hear of the, the traffic count, 13,000 and six or 4,000. How many of those are guests? I mean, I myself can go yeah. through the East Gate five <laughs> times a day. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, there's some, yeah. absolutely. I mean, Do I don't. Do have any, any count anywhere? Of, I'd, have to, I'd have to defer. I don't know the answer. Do the gates, should have they should be tracked. They, they have it, but I. We would love to have those metrics, and we don't as of today. The, the gate, the guard shacks, they do not count guest traffic. Uh, really? I've talked to Chief Middleton about that, so I'd, I'd love to see us get there quickly, actually. It's yeah. good information. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say so when the golf department, who is very actively promoting golf packages, golf outings, the golf there program, they're bringing in, and I, I can't speak for them, the, the exact numbers, John, you may know. But they are um, almost all of their traffic comes through the East Gate because most of the golf courses are out there, and so it's an opportunity really for all of those folks to stop there, pick up their passes, pick up you know get their map to make sure they know where to go and what their lodging might be, and any any package information that the golf department might have. You know, my vision anyway. was way above and beyond discovery packages. I mean, that is important. I mean, you understand when they're here on a package, they're not here on vacation. They're here to decide whether they want to move here or Delco Village or Fairfield Bay or whatever. But this is the vision is it being that front porch idea is what I'm trying to convey to you. An opportunity to just have a welcoming, warm experience with someone that comes in from that side. And I, again, our capital, Memphis, think about all the population that would theoretically come in through that gate and if we lose that presence there what is the first thing they're going to see the security guard, right and I know I and I get it y'all I get both sides of this I, I totally do how much does it cost us how much did it the, the way it is right now I'm sure there was a cost associated with making it look like that the total capital cost that went into it was fifty three thousand dollars 53 grand. 59. How much is it from month? I'm sorry. 1900. About uh, two grand, roughly. And the you staff. got three people. You have a, yes, you have That's a over and above the 1900, I'm assuming. Well, uh, yeah. And you're, you're looking, the board is just thinking more along the lines of marketing through um, not people going online and finding out about the village online. How are we going to market? They're kind of moving in that direction. They're not really talking about physically uh, marketing the village as much as they are electronically marketing the but village. It, but let's just take a minute and walk through through the numbers. We, we do have a three-person headcount out there, so we do have a substantial amount of payroll that is dedicated to that effort. Second, we have uh, the depreciation on the on the amount that uh, was already spent that is either going to be written off or or it's you know, going to be carried over time. Third, you have operating costs, just standard operating costs that that range from 
supplies, materials, travel cost, mileage, Utilities. incidental Utilities. Uh, utilities run somewhere like uh, was it four four thousand dollars a year or something like that. Um, so there is the nineteen hundred, which is the rent. That's the smallest portion yeah. of the total that we're spending in in that particular effort. And the so, other part is, what do we get from it? Well, we have uh, assessments, well, I'm my sure, but to the, the gate count was I, everybody looks at it from their own experience. And when we came down to visit, we usually arrived after 7 p.m. at night or when it's dark, and it's not going to be open then. No. And anybody who tried to schedule us to go talk to somebody about something while we were golfing and so forth, it wasn't going to happen. No. <laughs> um, just how many of those experiences are there? Discovery packages, I can see. You can tell them part of the thing is, we, this is where you check in. But absolutely. how many, uh, we kind of need some numbers of how many people come through the gates. And I mean, that should be a very basic thing. I don't can't imagine not having it, but. As far as traffic through a gate, approximately 7,500 vehicles on the west gate per day and around 5,000 per day on the west gate. Yeah, that was, vehicles but, but we don't mean know nothing. That, that break up within all that. Yeah. Right. If right. they've got a decal, you don't count them. You know, they, it's the ones who stop that we should be able to get some type of... Is there an opportunity to, to help relieve, you know, they do that at the west gate. Is there an opportunity to relieve some of the stress on the security at the east gate to drive them to our center and make it more viable? Force people to come in whether to get their passes or whatever to look around. Is there some way that we could we, we could do that? Medical. All right. Any other questions? I do have a quick question. Um, of course, when you mentioned the, the cost, the the payroll would not go away if the center was moved someplace. Correct. Else. Is that correct? Correct. Well, yeah. You still have the discovery package program itself. So. so the payroll would not go away. The leasehold improvements have already been fully depreciated over the life of the lease. Right. which has has passed so that's already expensive yeah. but has anybody talked to village health mark did they do a feasibility study there's a reason they built that big building there they don't spend money lightly for delivery so have we asked them about i, the I have not study? i'd be happy to, to to chat with them absolutely and see if they, they sure. know something or they would not have built sure. that facility there and can you give us an idea of what the income from the real estate program is, real estate partner program? Do you know that, or am I? I don't know. I I, I, I do. Am I allowed to? Sure. <laughs> Nineteen thousand dollars annually. Yeah. Okay. So how that works is the real estate's real estate brokers pay per agent, and it's two hundred dollars for this year. However, so that that income is not directly tied to that office. That's correct, Dan. That is correct. So that income would continue anyway. That's exactly right. But that's what it is. I mean, it is. No it secret. is. Right. I have a question. Yes, sir. I in the Discovery Center is important, but but you know we have a lot of B and Bs and mm -hmm. vacation rentals, and those people are coming in on the West Gate, some on the East at night, sometimes early in the morning. Is the East Gate really the, the, the best location to try to capture all of our visitors to Hot Springs Village? I mean, when to I me, came as a visitor, or, or I, was a, I was a gate runner first. Um, <laughs> 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 well, see, yeah, well, well, no. No. <laughs> but, but, you know, we go to Walmart. That, there used to be a grocery store out on the East Side, so a lot of people would go out to the East Side but that's no longer in existence. So now we have everybody going out the West Gate. If you're here for a week, buying your groceries, whether it's at Brookshire's or Walmart, and then coming back in. Well, and a lot of people don't ever go back out the East Gate until they leave. Well, see, I grew up in Little Rock, and I graduated from Bryant. I'm very familiar with that, with that part of the region. And I can tell you, if I'm coming out here to play golf, or I'm coming to enjoy an amenity, and I live in that area, and I'm not even familiar, I'm coming through that East Gate because I'm more familiar with it. It's easier for me. And the other thing, when they do that, it's almost like you're, you're, you have to pass by it automatically. It's not out of the way. You have to think about the, the metropolitan area of Maumelle and Conway, all those people that would be visiting our community to play golf on a stay and play package, they're gonna come through that East Gate. 
Sure. That, I mean, I'm telling you. Sure. I, I, <clears throat> but what about our visitors from Oklahoma, Texas? They're all coming they through the West Gate. If no, I, they're not. No, if no. I'm coming from Dallas, I'm still coming through the East Gate okay. because I'm going to get off at Interstate 30 right there at, the, at Highway 70. And then I'm going to, well, it depends. You take 128 and you can either go west if you're going to be playing DeSoto or you're staying over there. But if you're playing Granada and you're staying, it just depends on, that, that can be case by case. Or you come in on 7. Yeah. That's right. Right. You, that's exactly right. Well, you come down to scenic 7. Or GPS leads you to Danville Road. <laughs> Which we go round and round and round. Which leads right. you to the Balboa Gate. You have to, to the Balboa Gate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I even think. Look, growing up in Little Rock, I even think about marketing to places like Memphis. Where would you come in if you're coming from from the, from West Tennessee? You're going to come in through the East Side. That's how I think. Of it. Well, right. It's yeah. more of your metropolitan areas. Okay. Okay. Well, if, if I can answer just hard. one one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, please explain what the revenue is for that office alone not not the real estate program because the real estate program exists in its own the area the, the, the revenue. as far as is what is the re, what revenue are we getting and what is paying what is providing the roi on that particular the, the, space the, the discovery packages are basically a net even mm -hmm. dan there's not i mean the revenue comes in and it goes back out to pay for the lodging we have to stay competitive with our lodging cost, a golf cost, Fine. and so the revenue is net is net neutral. Okay. So, what we're saying is, there isn't revenue coming in for that office per se. That is correct. Your revenue and your return on your investment is start getting those visitors into that office and convert them into new property owners. Okay. All right. All right, John Paul, so is this, want to, I can't come out. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. <clears throat> uh, it sounds to me like ultimately the, this Eastgate location is a yes no decision for somebody. Yeah. Uh, that, that's yes, kinda, sir. That kind of sounds like yes, the direction sir. somebody yes, took. If it's a no, what alternatives? Other than the Eastgate, the current Eastgate location, absolutely, are, are absolutely. under consideration. Absolutely. Um, one of the options is the Chamber of Commerce. I've, I've heard that. Personally, I would rather, as, a, as POA employees, the three of us, we would prefer to be in a POA facility for free. I mean, I'm just telling you what I personally think. I'm a, I'm a board member of the Hot Springs Village Chamber of Commerce. I, I love working over there at the Chamber. I just don't, I just, uh, I have mixed feelings about interfering with the real estate folks who are already there working at on site. Um, sure we could find a way, absolutely. I enjoy being over there. I worked closely with John, the new chamber director over there, helped helped to bring him on, work with Faith, talk to Faith today. So either there or a POA facility. I mean ultimately I, my first choice, you all know what that is, but I get it. I understand. I'm committed to you. The only other facility that I would prefer is a POA facility, and if that be at the office, the POA office. I mean, I'd love to have a, a, an office space over here to the east side, but I just don't think there's availability. I, I don't. So I don't have an, an answer to that. I, I know that doesn't help you, but I at least... Well, I answered my question. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. John Paul? I know we're talking to the finance committee here, and you all deal in numbers every day. But this is this this decision. I think is more than numbers. If we had the money, if money wasn't the object, we'd have a a welcome center at both gates. We capture everybody that came in. Yes, they look at websites now. They they do everything online, but they physically have to get here sometime. They physically have to drop in, and I think his point is that the last thing we want them to do is run into the gate and be turned away. And if they don't have a reason to get in or have a reservation, they're going to be turned away in a lot of cases. As a, yeah, I agree with you. As a sales guy, I'm all about keeping that first impression factor. I don't want to lose that. We've That's been, critical. We've been looking at, at lodging coming to the village. We, des we def desperately need a lodge of some kind somewhere. The golf department alone could keep it full, uh, depending on the size, of course. But this is not a discussion about the lodge. 
<laughs> well, I, I, that's well, I've been trying to get one for ten years because you have twenty people, twenty four people, twenty eight people coming down to play golf. Yep. They want to stay together. Yep. They want to play together. They want. They don't want to be in a house here and a house here and a house here. They want to. They want to stay together. And that alone could keep it full. But that's a separate issue. When they were looking at the hotel or the or the lodge, they were looking at the geographical area and what people are, are drive to. And they were looking at seven hours of here. And there are 20, 20 million people within seven hours of us. They drive, and especially with COVID now, they're going to be driving down here. This is more than, a, I think, a dollars and cents decision right now. I think it has to be well thought out, and I don't want to rush to judgment on something that we might possibly need in the future. No, the numbers aren't there right now. There's no question about it. But we're right in the middle of COVID and a pandemic, and we're making decisions for the future. Yes, sir. I just think we've got to think about this logically and think about it strategically. All right, are, are there any numbers on, because there's been a tremendous amount of building, or we no longer have blank lots on both sides of us, and I'm really ticked off about that, <laughs> but it's good for the village, but there's been a number of people building. Do you have any uh, numbers on how many of those have stopped at the visitor center in the last year? It wasn't the visitor center. Well, I have to defer the, the back to, center. we've been open yeah. since January, our traffic has been negligible and this okay. dead a winter and then COVID so it's I mean, really, that's, that's, that's really tough but the, <coughs> are your numbers from village homes and land because they're uh, let me re they rephrase it again it, it, it was not utilized as that it was literally utilized as a space for real estate not really taken to the visitor center parameters of what it can be okay so uh, people sorry. who came for the discovery package in the past cool. didn't meet there philosophical Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, some of them, some of them came in and checked in there. Absolutely, because that's where that's where Susan is right now. That's All right, uh, I'd like to give the Birmingham's uh, uh, a few minutes to make a few. Thank you, guys. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Thank you very much. Before they begin, they they have uh, they have made some serious commitment to the community. Uh, certainly, have made serious uh, investments in our our community. And we want to thank them for, for doing that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dan. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just tell you about our experience with the Discovery Center. Um, I was out to lunch with friends in Long Beach, California, and uh, one of the gals there mentioned Hot Springs Village. And um, she said, when I visited my friends out there, she said, I bought that day. And I thought, that's significant. So I want to find out more about Hot Springs Village. I came home, I talked with Susan, we went online, we saw the different packages that the Discovery Center offers, like with golf, without golf, and I said, we should go check this place out. And uh, so we signed up for the three-hour tour, which reminded me of Gilligan's Island. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and we, we, Susan booked us a flight to Dallas, and thinking that it was a three-hour drive, but it was a five-hour drive. So we landed at Dallas Drive here. We come to the gate to check in, and we're going to stay at the, one of the houses of Mark, Mount Carmel. So we're late, and we get lost. And we pulled into the Remax Realty Center up there off the Soto and, uh, and Potts. And um, there were, it was after hours. So there was two gals there, Jane and Darla. <laughs> we were going to ask for directions on how to get to where we're going to stay. They gave them to us and they said, you know, why are you here? And we said, we're going to take the uh, tour tomorrow. And uh, they said, well, if, if you want to see anything, stop in and see us afterwards. And uh, we said, okay. So we checked in, I think, at 10 a.m. with um, first, upon first entering La Plaza, I thought it was a nice center. I thought the parking lot needed a little work, but I thought that, that it was a nice center and it was a, it was a nice space, yes. you know. That, that, and the, and the uh, gal there was very kind and we jumped in her car and she gave us the tour. And it was an extensive tour and uh, showing us everything. And uh, even like lots here you can buy and approve <coughs> contractors that'll build to suit. And um, 
and but it wasn't really a uh, a uh, real estate like presentation. It was more just the amenities of of Hot Springs Village, and which was nice. I mean, it was you know it was very nice. But since we had met Darla and Jane, we after we finished that we went over there, and um, and the fourth fourth house we saw we bought over on Lake Estrella, wow. and uh, which to me was like, I don't do things this fast. Yeah. <laughs> I, this is, you know, I don't, I don't like, this is crazy. You know, like, and uh, I said, we'll sleep on it, but write it up. I said, we'll sleep on it, we'll let you know in the morning. Mm -hmm. if, and then to sign, we, we signed, we bought. Then we came back and visited back and forth from Long Beach, California. And the third time we're here, I said, it doesn't feel like we're going home, it feels like we're leaving home. And um, so that's when we decided to sell back there and then really make this our home. So we did, and um, we, uh, we bought, we sold the original house, bought another one on Lake Balboa, and then um, we owned commercial property back there, so we started advertising that for sale. And um, we bought the uh, La Plaza Center and um, and then subsequently after that, because we have to invest more money to avoid the taxes, we bought the Cordova Center. And uh, we have one other building that'll go into escrow tomorrow or Thursday. And then we're gonna invest that out here. The, um, so I guess my point is, is that we heard it, you know, looked online, booked the Discovery Tour. The only thing that, that I would suggest for the Discovery you know, space is stronger push on real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, like what are you looking for? What's your budget? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just and then they can maybe even pinpoint what their tour is mm -hmm. better in that regard. Anyway, we're gonna the, the when by the La Plaza Center, we're going to redo the parking lot because I I didn't like that originally, <laughs> and the side monument we're gonna make three or four times bigger mm -hmm. because I don't really feel like you see it, you know. And um, Cordoba Center, we are, we're doing major, major investment there. We have new roofs on it already. We're doing um, exterior paint starts next Tuesday. Climate Control is putting all new HVACs in every single unit. Um, and we're doing Wi-Fi, um, thermostats in every unit. All the lighting is going to be LED. Uh, the parking lot there is going to be redone and restriped. It'll be a premier center. And um, so, return on investment. We stopped at a discovery center and by the time we're almost done, we will invest at $3 million here. Mm -hmm. And then we're just one couple. We're only one couple. And um, I will say this, all the the blue states and blue cities that are on fire, literally, and we left California just in the nick of time. Um, if you, and there are entire web pages of leaving California, leaving Illinois, leaving Connecticut, leaving New York. You just put a little blurb in there about here, paradise. You're gonna yeah. get this. You fill yeah. the Discovery Center. I mean, people are fed up around the country and we were one of them, you know. Overtaxed, overregulated, over feed, over everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're so grateful to be here. So um, yeah, this is our home and we are in the process of building community mm -hmm. and um, we're grateful. So the Discovery Center, we'd love to see it stay. That was our first introduction. Uh -huh. To Hot Springs Village. Yeah. So. so it's kind of sentimental for us. Too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was the first place where we really got to learn about the village. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, you had a question. Well, I just, because you, when you bought the, the center, yes. were there any expectations that were provided to you about the POA remaining in that space? No, 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 no. 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 There was one vacancy at the time, which we've now filled. Yeah. And um, redoing the parking lot, redoing the sign monument, new striping. We want to make it, you know, we want to make it really a fabulous place to 
to rent so that whoever rents is happy about the space they have and any clients they have say, man, this place looks good. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we have a commitment to having property on both entrances into the village. We want them both to be the jewels that enter into Wonderland, <laughs> you know, because that's what this is. For us, it is. It yeah, is. This is. And there are more people like us. And you know, we're just one couple, as Jim said, we've invested three million. Are we going to stop at three million? Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> she has a plan. <laughs> you know, all we know is that this is our home. Yeah. And we want more and more people of our elk to come here and enjoy this last portion we call it the last trimester of our life. <laughs> it's the best trimester of our life. Yeah. And um, you know, Kevin, I went in and met everyone in there. And it is so welcoming in there. And it is so beautifully done mm -hmm. that it, it sets the stage yeah. for what you can expect of the quality that you will receive in the village. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, sir. Jim, we have an opening on our volunteer group. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be available? <laughs> Time's running in here. <laughs> if you're not, maybe Susan. Volunteering maybe, you know? doing what? I'm also, I'm, I'm also interested in the million, next million. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the second question, where do you live on Balboa? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's great. In the Narvez development on um, with about a point I mean we live right on the point it seems like we mentioned this the most Lee <laughs> Solomon previously lived in that house and um, I was actually driving our golf cart around the neighborhood today and I saw one of the neighbors and they said oh yeah you guys live down there in that beautiful house they said that is probably the most desirable lot within the whole village because we're right on this like point. Like it's so is it a peninsula? Yeah. It, is, it is. Yes. And there's a new house on it? No. No, no. no it was this, built. Okay. Trust me. This house and Cordoba Center have a lot in common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very nice. I mean, so. Um, Opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for allowing thank us. Thank you, Susan. We've written you a little letter just to introduce yeah. ourselves to that that's what they handed out. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to have people who come into the community and invest like that. But it's great. All right. So you don't have to leave. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, sausage. So uh, basically, the, that those are the, the basics of the, the question at hand. Uh, Lloyd has some additional information to, to share as well. Yeah, um, you know, like Kevin has already said, I get it. The having something out there is nice, and it would be desirable. We're in a cash flow crunch in the village. I don't know when we're going to get out of that cash flow crunch. The real question for the board is do we continue to subsidize what has up to this point been a non-starter and a non-producer? That's the decision the board has to make. I get the future. The point is can we afford to continue down this path. We've had this operation since 2016, starting in Hot Springs. And I'll just give you some numbers because you guys had asked for them. In, so far this year, and of course we've got COVID, they have reported through May that they have 20 discovery packages booked. Those are pass-throughs. So you can't count on any revenue from that. Their figures indicate they've had 19 walk-ins. Now, if you look at 2019, they had 81 total discovery packages, or approximately seven per month, okay? Of those, they reported that they had seven property conversions. 
For the whole year? For the whole year of 2019. In 2018, they had six that they related to the discovery packages. So the question is, we put almost $60,000 worth of renovations in on a two-year lease, which one has to question why we would do that on a two-year lease to start with. Uh, sounds like that's been already depreciated because it was on a two-year lease. The question is, do we, we put another $30,000 a year continuing into that on the bet that we're going to get more traffic at the east gate and that it's going to convert into um, revenues because if you look at the seven properties and you take the assessments you can't you know we don't know whether they're going to be playing golf or eating at the restaurants and that kind of thing but those sevens would have generated about fifty eight hundred dollars a year in revenue, revenue. They cost us for each new resident $33,922. Unfortunately, I'm a numbers guy too. Yeah. And this is to me, I love the sentimental fact that we would love to have something out there. I just don't know if it financially makes sense. And that's the decision the board has got to make. And unfortunately, you have to give us guidance to do that. So that's that was the purpose of today. Um, and with that, that's all I have. Yeah, the, the 33,000 includes payroll allocated to that. It does, and the payroll is not going to go away. Right. So how much are we talking, the 22,000 yeah, a year for the, for the rent in 19 Well, month? your rent and your, uh, your, your rent's rent. about 24. I don't know. Kevin, do you know what the rent or the utilities are out there? No, but I can find out by the Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I can't imagine there. I think you're talking a $30,000 number yeah, that you're going to have to continue subsidizing. Well, the property owners are going to have to continue subsidizing to be in that space. I think that's a fair number to probably be dealing with. But if you move that space to, uh, let's say, someplace other any place is going to cost you something yeah even if you put it yeah. in a, an existing poa office well, there's still the opportunity cost well uh, the, there, are, there are several factors one is moving them into a poa office there there is available space and you have no space cost uh, the uh, utilities, you'll run some, right. but incidental to the, the operation of the building. Right. And uh, there will still be some supplies and materials costs that they, they will require just to, as employees. Right. The, um, so the, the big nut here is the $1,900 uh, rent right. and $1,955. And, and the utilities which I, I've been uh, told run uh, somewhere close to 5,000 a year, mm -hmm. which is about 400. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really what we're, we're talking about. I mean, about. So, so the first option is uh, to move it to unoccupied POA right. office. Okay. And so, uh, the, and, and I know we've taken a lot of time today because there, it is to some extent uh, an emotional issue uh, as well as a practical issue. Of, well, and as, Jay, as John Paul indicated, it's also a strategic issue. It's a long-term strategic right. issue. So we wanted to, to give it time to be aired out, and uh, obviously we have a board meeting tomorrow. It's not scheduled to be voted on tomorrow. No. But we, we do expect it to be discussed at some point during the, the conversation, so. And, and on the East Gate, how much longer does the lease run, the current lease? Does the it, current lease has expired. Has yeah. expired. Let me just give you a little history on that, too. May 31st. The board was presented with the new lease on May 27th and told that we had to sign it by June 1st. <laughs> so that kind of put us into a bit of a bind as no due diligence had been done. 
And the initial re reaction was, we're not going to do it. The Birminghams have been kind enough to allow us to do a month to month while we're going through this process of trying to decide what we need to do. I think you should also understand, for those that don't, the functions that Kevin is talking about currently take place at the West Gate, where most of the traffic is, where personally I believe most of it is going to stay over the years because that's where the growth is going to be. There will be some on the east side. The fact that new housing is coming on the east side is one thing, but you got the same problem with people coming in the west gate that I'm bringing as a realtor all the way to the east gate to look at properties. Uh, so it, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. But um, having the center out there would be nice. But everything that goes on, goes on in the chamber right now as it is. You have chamber people who push Hot Springs Village. You have realtors who pay to be sitting there. Um, I know there's, Kevin has mentioned that maybe the realtors, but I'm also on the board of realtors, and I've gotten indication from the realtors that there's not any more people that want to do those kind of things. So. I don't know, and, and this has been brought before the Board of Realtors to discuss also, so relative to what involvement they might want down the road. So, Any, any discussion? Thoughts? Well, just as a property owner, coming in the West Gate is not impressive. Coming in the West Gate is what? Not impressive. When I say bring my guests in, I always bring them in the East Gate because if they came in the West Gate, it's not impressive. It's, it's old. The bank building is old looking. The only impressive part of it is the chamber building. And then you immediately go past a little church and it's not impressive. That's just my opinion. Oh, you don't like the fountain and all? The, the fountain is beautiful, but if you come in right as you turn in, all you see is where they tore down the Cooper building, you see the oh, old bank, yeah, and you have to intentionally look to see the fountain. The fountain is fabulous. Yeah. But uh, sure. unfortunately, that's about it. You go past a small Walmart, you you know, you know see the, yeah. a, a McDonald's. Any other I, thoughts? Well, my thought is I've tried to make it a point to talk to, again, there's three new houses going in on our street right, you know, within two blocks of me, and there's a bunch of building on all of Isabella and Granada. And I try to talk to as many of those people as I can meet. And to my knowledge, not one of them has stopped at the Discovery Center. Not one of them has come as a result of our internet marketing or our marketing as a whole. It's like, oh, well, it was an accident. Oh, I knew so-and-so that stopped here. And I just... I'd love to have a Discovery Center because I can see three or four years to now where we would need something like that, I hope. Uh, but I just feel it's a, an unnecessary expense, possibly in a very expensive time or a very cash, cash uncertain time. But it's like Jim and Susan said, they, didn't, they found out from friends or from people yeah. that were talking about the village, and I think a lot of us is that way. And then you get onto the internet and you start looking, you basically do what Jim did. And then the only thing that I might, do you have, it sounds like discovery packages are the big thing. But can you do a, can you sell a discovery package through a real estate company instead of through our own office? I, I don't know why. Well, they, they are offered through the realtors. The, the, well, how did, and I hesitate, how did we get I hesitate in to bring that? this up, but the problem with the discovery <laughs> packages is that we're using outside lodging. The realtors all have realtor program or rental programs that each of them run. If they have a discovery package, they're going to want to use their rentals. Well, wouldn't that be a good thing? It would be for the realtors, yes. It, it would make them want to be more involved in the process, I believe. Yes. But 
that's again that's one person's opinion on the board so well and I'll chime in on that and because I have some familiarity I know some people who have come through a realtors program because that was their contact and the places they put them in I know of two couples that happened to be from Nebraska and didn't know us at the time well they knew us but didn't know we were down here uh, and they were ready to leave because they said if this is indicative they were and our, our rentals, when we came down, I'm going circularly, uh, we had a dog. So I assumed we stayed in dirty places uh, because we wanted someplace pet friendly. But, and not, I'm not trying to discourage realtors, sure. but some of them are relatively dingy. They really are, and there's, it turns people off. Yeah. And I know Kevin has done a great deal of work to find places that are a bit more modern and after, we've, we've Personally, we visited three years before we came, and after the first year, I brought my cleaning supplies with me because we couldn't stay in the places that, okay. and that was, that wasn't, but I know people have been through the real I And I can't disagree with you on that. Uh, rental, that's a whole other bailiwick. Yeah, well, it this is. whole rental thing it needs is. to be addressed at some point in yeah. time. Yeah. Because it does turn people off. Yes. All right. Uh, anybody feel strongly one way or the other? Not at this moment. Anybody want to make a motion? To do what? Recommend to the board that... Uh, well, if the board isn't, excuse me, if they're not going to vote on it tomorrow, it's not going to be, could we uh, shelve it for a week and discuss it in next Tuesday's meeting, maybe? I think I'll think on it a little bit. That would be a fair thing to do. I mean, I'm we fine. all just learned about it just now. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of how I feel. This yeah. give us a little time to absorb everything that we've been told, <clears throat> work some numbers and then maybe make a decision next week. I know it's time, we're on a timeline, but if the board's not gonna see it tomorrow, then we do have some reprieve. Okay, I'm fine with that. Everybody agree? Agree. Mm -hmm. Derek? I do have a question for Kevin. Yes, sir. You know, uh, a person coming in on a discovery package and then goes and buys a house does not really help the POA get rid of lots. So how, how do we get people to at least maybe look at buying a lot? You know, a realtor should be the one forking the bill to bring in a client that's making 6% off a sale of a house, but, uh, but they don't want to sell a lot because it's only five or, or, or $20,000. Oh, how that do we do that? We're short people for that. Well, I can assure you that whatever I'm talking about discovery packages, whether it be at a trade show or any place, I'm talking about lots, but I can't, make it. No, 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 no. I mean, but I, it's not, it's not that I don't encourage lots because I'm well aware of new construction helps us out with new assessments. Absolutely. One of the, the things that we really haven't talked very much about here is the new marketing plan that we're working on with the sales agency and the primary focus around that redesign of the website and all of our messaging has been to create building on lots. You, we, uh, if you look at the, when you get a chance to look at the new design, you'll see we have builders on, we've heightened the builders, we've heightened the discovery packages, and we've heightened the relationship with our realtor program. But as we did that, one of the primary focuses with all of those programs was to drive lot sales because we were given a goal of 2,500 lots in 20 years. And so we passed that on to the marketing company to say we need to make sure that all of our messaging and design is around that focus. I can tell you too, in the Discovery Center itself, there's a very large map. I mean, it's probably 10 feet, two of them, 10 feet by five feet tall that take up a, a two huge walls. And it's the map of the village with all every lot on it, and it shows the ones that are available for sale. Like the POA own lots specifically are on there. And see, that was it was a tool that was used during the village homes and land process. But today, it's at least a visual for people to see as they as they come in. We just know that delinquent lots. We have a lot, but when there's a residence on it, it's like 99% up to date. So, and most of those that are delinquent are in probate or some other type of legal situation. And so we're going to get that money, and we need to generate new money, which means a lot and a house. Could agree with you, Mark. All right, but very uh, difficult to do that. I know. So shall we move on to the next point?
Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, marketing subcommittee status. The, the charter is approved. Um, we are. We have a number of uh, uh, people who have agreed to serve. We have two more interviews I think, I think this so. week. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to wrap the committee up uh, this week and, and get it going next week. But I know I've said that last week, but uh, it took us a little longer than we thought. So okay. Uh, Working groups. Uh, the CMP review, strategic planning discussion, the, the review is done, uh, and strategic planning, how are we doing? Okay. <clears throat> Prior to this meeting, uh, our, our group uh, met for the very first time. Um, we did some housekeeping things like uh, appointed a, uh, what I call a ringleader. Uh, we don't have a chair. Uh, secretary, um, we talked about um, expanding the work group. Uh, you had provided a couple of names. Uh, I had suggested that uh, I would want somebody from staff to be on our group. Uh, basically, we just talked about uh, the variety of issues about expanding, and uh, we want to discuss that even further. So, uh, no specific. Um, Okay. Uh, outcomes with respect to that. So Who's far. the ringleader? Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. it was it was a tough campaign. <laughs> now I ask who's secretary. Yeah. Who's secretary? <laughs> <laughs> well, the secretary position was when we start onboarding more people, the current secretary may decide to give up his position yeah. to one of the... I have the option. If a newbie comes in... Right. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he said he got fired from the last secretary. That's right. That's right. At the end. We name it for a resignation this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other issue was uh, simply meeting, and um, I was out of the room. I don't know that we came to a decision, but... I think maybe Thursday think in the Thursday, afternoon, yeah. Thursday depending afternoon, upon golf situation. But we're going to expand our meeting time considerably uh, for two reasons. Number one is we have lots and lots of um, issues, and the other is uh, the inability of the ringleader to keep the conversation focused. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're going to stay a little bit after, too, right? Yeah. yeah. We're going to stay a little bit after. Yeah, we're going to stay you, a little bit after. Let's this. go. We're, we're fine. <laughs> right. Okay. And what time on Thursdays? I think 2.30. Well, this is an ad hoc it's meeting. It's so just a group meeting. But I think one of the outcomes of that meeting will be when are we going to meet the yeah. next for some ridiculously long period of time until we, you know, can actually make a decision. Well, we're so looking at it more of a staff. marathon than a sprint. Uh, we this did is discuss a big, big key name, deal. It is. But there was some discomfort with yeah, that name, okay. <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, well, let me know when you come up with Sure. That. Well, the other thing was uh, considering perhaps a former staff people who are no longer okay. uh, employed, but uh, still have okay. uh, a lot of contacts and knowledge of, of staff. That's open-minded. Right. New ideas. Um, well, yeah, I was going to say. And I'm, team player. I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn if I say we're oh. open to suggestions. We're open to suggestions. If, uh, of additional staff, if anybody yeah. has some specific ideas. Mm -hmm. On the 2010 strategic plan, there were 40 people on that committee. It was pretty extensive. <laughs> That, that's not I what I emphasize. I, I would emphasize the, they had 10 months. They <laughs> <laughs> have almost a year. That, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, well, and we don't expect to take that long. Uh, no. Tom, you thought maybe by the end of the year for sure that we could. Don't quote me on that, but I mean, certainly but, I understand. Yeah. And quote, you know, an aggressive timeline is uh, way more desirable than 10 months. And yeah. I'm not thinking 10 months at all, yeah. but well, uh, yeah, we I mean, also, that's something that we as a group need to come up with. I think, I think you, you need a, a core group that, that uh, is doing the, the basic program. If you, if you have 40 people just sitting in a room, yeah. nothing gets done. We, and right. so if we have the, the marketing group doing their thing, we have uh, the budget group doing their thing, right. and you guys are, are working through the, the core. If we decided problem. to do a deep dive into something, 
Well, we expand, you know, maybe not all of us get into it, but maybe one of us get into it and we expand with people helping yeah. out you know, in that particular area. Yeah, we should bring in experts at, at the time, so we need them. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, budget oversight uh, discussion. Uh, obviously, there are some changes that are going to have to happen with how we're budgeting. Um, and we we'll, uh, I need to spend some time with Karina on that and Karina and Jama and then we'll uh, we'll get back to you guys to schedule something. Yeah, I mean you last week alluded to some changes in the budgeting process, so we got yeah, definitely get We're, up to speed on that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing too, uh, maybe a couple minutes of discussion. Uh, also, well, I've spent some time uh, just trying to self-educate a little bit on, on zero-based budgeting. Okay, I've not personally gone through that myself. It's been the, the other kind, but um, I think we're going to need uh, the form. Uh, you know, like you said, a, a work group, a team, who's going to be on the team, identify an offer we're going to meet, and find the best way to uh, find the best way to tackle it because we've got a, a long way to go and. Uh, uh, are, has any budget development at all been going on as of cursory? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Virtually nothing. Yeah. Okay. Virtually nothing. Okay. I have a request. Um, I think that budget calendars exist. They do. Yes. Is, is it worth us seeing that or is it kind of? I think it was. Okay. I think it was very extensive. Um, it seemed to drag out for six, seven, eight months, mm -hmm. and it was so laborious, I don't believe building a budget is that difficult. I might be mistaken. But once you fill in pay, you know, once you fill in the human resource factor, then the rest is projects, capital. Yeah, it's not it's, I just yeah. don't think it's, it should be that extensive. I, I know we do ours in about six weeks. I, I, yeah. That's my okay. experience. That's exactly right. Okay. So the calendar's there, but but you don't think you, we need to be we need to uh, set looking at it. But I mean, you, you have other ideas, but I think Dan yeah. and I both do. <laughs> yeah. and and part of it, and, you know, when you're when you spend six or eight months doing your budget, that means you back up and you start doing your budget before you have any results. Exactly. And so what you're really doing is comparing the two years before, not the prior year, and so your 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 frame of reference is totally skewed. So, um, you know, if we can get this to a uh, six to eight week process and uh, we can spend that time productively with the department, then I think all of us would be a whole lot better off. Okay. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll throw this out there. But what I've learned in reading about zero based budget, if we are, in fact, want to do that, mm -hmm. we do want to approach it that way. That's we don't pay attention to last year's numbers. We don't pay attention to what our expenses were last year. In fact, if I was if I was making a budget for my department, my department, let's say I have recreation, I'm making something up here. Okay. On a zero base budget, I would come and I would present what my expenses are going to be in 2021. Not what they were last year and they are basically going to be the same at 3%. But what are my expenses going to be line item by line item by line item and, and basically defend them, mm -hmm. you know, and defend them against challenges about why, why is that contractor, why are you paying him $70,000 to mow the yard? If you look there, am I right there? Is that where yeah, you, you've had experience with that? It sounds like I, I don't have that well, real world experience with that. You, you, you and that's very, that's very detailed and very, it's very time consuming. It, it is detailed. Yeah. Um, I mean, our our budget packages are are substantial, mm -hmm. but they're formulas, and so you you basically start with uh, I need X number of employees to do this, right? And the, those employees on this type of of day of operation, I need three of these and four of those and two of these, yeah. and. They're at various pay rates, and then you add up how many days of that that you have, and then that that tells you what your monthly payroll is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you you also have um, some things that are a frame of reference uh, advertising you know if you're going to you know uh, buy advertising you you use a frame of reference what you've done in the past that worked and you you key off of that um, if you're if you have uh, subscriptions to magazines you know or whatever you have to have X number of, of, uh, of those listed and, and you know what those cost the it is a thoughtful process now some things are you know there is a base cost to operate a golf course and that is to operate at minimum standards and you have a, a basic golf course, then it's a matter of what standard you want to operate. Right. So if you want to operate it at a, a five or a seven or a 10, and then you, budget, you adjust your budget accordingly uh, to do that. And so uh, some of our, our courses right now are, are probably eights. Some of them uh, aren't. And so we need to, to look at that and say, you know, where, where do we need to be? Uh, I don't know, John Paul, would you call any of our courses 10s right now? Uh, you know, we, we have work to do at every course. Some things... But what, what will our goal be? And that will be a point of discussion. Do we want to shoot for all of them to be 10s? Probably. No. And that's, that's, I don't know. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I think the other thing is we've got to get to a point of knowing what, at that minimum level, what's it cost us to operate at that minimum level. Mm -hmm. And then, as Dan said, what's the next step up to be above? Because until we get to that base number, we don't know how much we're subsidizing that particular entity for. And we've got to get to that point. Right. Mm -hmm to explain that to the property owner so that they understand why we might have to do something in certain areas, like assessment increases, those kind of things. Yeah, so, we, are, we are likely to end this year with a $2 million subsidy again mm -hmm. in golf. And, oh, yes. and we, we need to figure out how do, we, you know, how do we avoid that in the future? Is it, you know, uh, do we have to price differently so we increase the number of rounds? Do we need to, to price differently to increase the amount of off-site play, uh, you know, from outside uh, play, or do, you, uh, do we have to, to implement a, a group program uh, to do those things? Uh, you know, we're, we have 2,400 rounds of golf on groups this book for this year. Uh, we had 4,800 before the, uh, the virus hit. And, and we, so we lost half of them. But what do we really need? How many, how many rounds of, of uh, group uh, uh, tournaments do we really need? You know, I, my guess is that 4,800 is not bad compared to where we were, but it's nowhere near where we should be. Uh, you know, five, ten years from now, we should, we should probably be in, in multiples of, of those levels. So, you know, how are we going to get there? And that, that's part of, that's part of what the, all the planning and, and marketing and strategic planning is all about, is, is how do we fill those gaps? So, uh, so yeah, we've, we've got to look at the, the dollars and cents of, of what we're doing. Uh, in particular, office expense. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've spent a lot of a lot of time in, in the finance area talking about is that we so far this year we've processed seven thousand invoices. Oh, well, over yes. From we, January through May thirty first, I believe it was yeah. roughly seventy three hundred. Wow, that's an astronomical number. It is for this operation. Uh, there is no way in hell we should be processing 7,300 invoices. But what's happening is if, if you're working at uh, the Balboa Golf Course and you need supplies, you go get supplies. You go, go out and go to Walmart and buy supplies. Or you go wherever and, and buy supplies. If you're, if you're at DeSoto, you go somewhere else and buy supplies. We don't have that central purchasing process 
in place. That could save money. That could save an incredible amount of yeah, money. Yeah. An incredible amount, incredible amount of time in the, the yeah. finance department. We have to get more efficient in what we're doing. And so as, as we're looking at the budget, we want to look at not only what it costs to do A, B, and C, but what is the process to do A, B, and C, so that we're, we're doing the processes right. Uh, right now, we're not. You know, we, we know, and this is just one example, that our processes aren't correct. So that's, that's the kind of thing that the starting from, from scratch uh, allows us to look at. So. Well, of those 7,000 invoices, in 2020, we still have two-part purchase order forms on paper that are signed four or five times yeah. before they get back to the yeah. It, it is. I mean, I, it's hard to believe we're still there. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want to say we're in the dark ages. But yes, we are. But. <laughs> <laughs> we're close. We're, but we're in the shadows. <laughs> we can see it. Here. Now, we haven't talked about it on strategic planning yet, but that should be something that we should be looking for in three years down the line. How do we, how do we increase our, our um, Efficiency. efficiencies? Yeah. Uh, basically, the finance is a big, big area that I think we could we could really make a difference. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a big task. And speaking about golf, there's a YouTube video that has you in it from eight years ago <laughs> that was put on by Remax. I had more hair, right? A little more hair, <laughs> not that much. <laughs> but you talked about twenty-eight dollars around golf. And you were very, very proud of our golf courses. It was a great YouTube, I thought. It really, I thought somebody looking at it from outside of the village would be very impressed with it. And you were the lead, I think, on Even the whole thing. The <laughs> well, I mean, and, and they haven't fallen down uh, that much, if, if at all. Um, there's. It, you know, this is a hard thing, and, and this is, I was here for 16 years, and it really depended on what board was in place, which way the wind blew, because you'd have a board that would come on that say, would say, we need to decrease subsidies in golf, how can we do it? And we'd go that way for two or three years, and then another board would come on and say, no, we need to keep the cost of golf low to attract people to the village to pay assessments. Okay, so it was a constant tug of war for years and years and years on which way it would go. And the way it won out most of the time was to keep it as low as you possibly could to attract people to the village to yeah. buy. And at, at one point, when, when I was here, uh, the first go round, 97, there were only six golf courses doing 60,000 rounds apiece. Okay, now you can't do any more rounds. Well, you can, but not many more rounds than that. And, and then we came in, I don't want to give you history and I won't take a line, but then you came in and built Isabella and Granada and the rounds, the rounds uh, cannibalized themselves. And we had, and the board came out at that time and said, please don't build Granada, we don't need it. To the, to the Cooper people. And they said, no, we're, we're, we've done the study and we need it and you got to take it because we have to give you the amenity and you have to take it. And, and they did. And it's, it's a good thing because Isabel and Granada were a step up. Uh, and we put more money into those golf mm -hmm. courses and it's attracted a lot of people here. And there's no question about it. But that's the history of it is which way the wind was blowing as far as the subsidy goes. Right. And that's, that's a big question. And, oh. and, and that subsidy question is, is a lot today. Yeah, and it's not just golf. It's it's everything. It's everything. Everybody has a little piece of the of the pie. But golf has the most revenue, so it gets the most attention as far as subsidy and revenue. But that brief history. Thank you. Yeah, but, this... but the decision that would we as a planning group, you know, that we've got the finance side, but we as a planning group have to decide: Do we want all of our courses to be sixes or sevens or nines or what, where are they? I mean, I, I probably would never say we should be tens, but 
you know, is is eight good enough? And and that's that's something we 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 need to make a recommendation to the board of what that should be. Yeah. But well, the good thing is, I mean, I it ourselves. I, I couldn't mm -hmm. tell you the difference between an eight and a six. <laughs> well, the good thing is, is quality of grass. Yeah. Not Even the today, the amount of weeds and crabgrass over here and that over there. Okay. Well, we all know Balboa's tired. We all know that that course needs a renovation over there. Right. It's 30 years old and it's tired. But if you were to ask 10 people what their favorite courses are, you're going to get seven different answers. Right. And that's the beauty of the village. Right. There's really not one. Well, Granada and Isabella are a little bit above the others, but they're not head and shoulders above the others. And Granada's and Balboa's tired, but Balboa has the best greens of any of the courses yeah. still. And that's why people will play over there. And you're you're gonna that's that's the good news. The good news is, yeah, you can you can elevate them. Sure, you can. You can you can do a lot of things that in, in the short term that that would uh, make them better. But I don't know if you're going to increase the rounds by making them that much better. Right. Uh, just take a little better care of them, and, and and spend the money where you need to. I said when I when I left, we didn't have anything leased in this village. Nothing. There were no golf carts leased. There were no no equipment of any kind of lease. And then, now we have quite a few leases. Uh, and I don't know if that was for cash flow purposes or what, uh, but, but we didn't. And I thought all we needed to do was keep up with the cost of living. Well, we haven't had any assessment increases to speak of in the last few years, so we've, had, we've needed that money uh, where the assessments would have taken uh, hold of that. But if you go back, to, to 1970 when this place was built. The assessment was $12 a month. It was $12 a month. And golf was free at DeSoto. They had to pay for a cart, but it was free. And then, then they started charging a few years later. But just take the cost of living adjustment to that $12, what it would be now. I, I haven't done the math, but I bet it's 80 to $90, somewhere in that vicinity. And that would be every lot, not just the built on lots. That, right. and, and so you can see we're behind on our assessments. Well, there's no doubt about it. But uh, you've got a tough job in trying to figure out the subsidies and, and do we go towards getting more people here and keeping things low or do we raise the rates or raise the, the uh, participation to get it. So I don't, I don't envy you your job. I didn't know if this okay. was a pro oh, go ahead. <clears throat> I don't know how you could possibly rate between a six and eight. I play all the golf courses, okay? So say it's an eight, and well, okay, we're gonna ground downgrade it to a six to save cost. What does that mean? We're not gonna well, no, mow it, as much, we're not gonna it, it's <laughs> more <laughs> how far we we're, we're gonna try to bring it. Right. I don't think you downgrade it. You yeah. just you can elevate it. We could redo all the bunkers. That would be the biggest thing. And you could spend four to five hundred thousand per course uh, doing all the bunkers, and that's carving them out, putting the new stuff in with nice white sand, and you've really upgraded your course. But you then know. some of the bunk, some uh, of the yeah. courses, you might say, let's go to a grass bunker well, because of the expense of a sand of, yeah, of the, the yeah, yeah of the main which thing. is something that already was suggested. We've done that. We've had to do that, but. A lot of people will also say that they like because of the greens. There's a lot of people that'll say Balboa is one of their favorite Absolutely. courses. Cortez, sand traps are no, fantastic it, in Cortez. Well, it was I mean, redone they, last. That was the last course to be redone. And they, re, they keep keep up. They keep up with their sand traps every year. Last year they redid ten of them. But, uh, but that's why you elevate up. You don't. You're, you're not talking about going down in quality on it. Yeah, because even like Granada and hot weather, we'll lose at 13th green at par three. Mm -hmm. We've lost it two or three times. Depending on the year. You know, we couldn't so even well, have the tournament. Well, I mean, there are major discussions in all these yeah. areas, but we're just talking in generalities yeah. now, and I was giving you a, a little yeah. bit of history going back. But as, as the courses get older, they, as John said, they get tired, and, and you have to invest in them to well, bring them back up. Well, the USGA, for instance, the, the United States Golf Station uh, says that after 30 years you need to redo a golf course. That's pretty much standard. Some do it at 20, some do it at 15. But Balboa's 30 plus now, so you're looking at that. 
but bunkers, they, they'll tell you that they need to be run every 12 to 15 years. And they haven't been done, yeah. not in a long time. We just haven't had the money. We'd love to do it, but you just don't have the money to do that right now. So, so part of our planning has to be, if that, if that course is 20 years old, we know that we, at 30, we probably are gonna need to, to do some major work to it. How do we plan our finances to be there when we hit 30. Uh, you know, right now, we have some reserves, but the but when you look around at all the deferred maintenance that we need to do, it probably would eat up everything that we've got in reserves yeah, and more. Sure, yeah. Yeah. And so we're, you know, even some things that are fairly basic, like, you know, if you drive up to the Magellan Clubhouse from the, the cart barn, you're greeted with a wall of weeds. Mm -hmm. But we're not, we're not, we can't do that. We, you, have, you have to have a sense of arrival when you get there. Then you, you've <laughs> arrived at a classy place and it's nice. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy playing Balboa too, but I don't like to play if it's rained, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, well, if I may, just for a minute. Mm -hmm. We've spent millions of dollars in the last few years on infrastructure that's invisible. Culverts, uh, lift stations. Yeah, the sewer, the wastewater treatment plant, lift stations, IT, stuff that people don't see, nothing, millions of dollars. The visible stuff, I think, is what people need to see. And what, what we're working on right now is some little things like the Ponce parking lot, the Isabella parking lot, the Granada parking lot. They're, they're, they're in disarray. You can't, there are no stripes. All they need to be is sealed in stripes. And I think for very little money, you can give a visual account of the village and, and the first impression when you see it elevated a little. Some, yeah. some uh, uh, commodes and urinals that are so outdated when you walk in, you just really sure. can't believe. It. Not much money, yeah. but stuff that's visible, straightening the street sign, Cleaning street signs, uh, replacing them where we need to, mm -hmm. just giving a nice account. And that's very little money that we could spend for visual yeah. things. And that's what we were talking about. That's what Jim was talking about, his first impression. He wanted to clear the parking lot, remember? Mm -hmm. That's the first impression he said. I want to get that parking lot clean. Well, look at this. Just for example, stuff. look at the Ponce parking lot. That thing, it really is bad. And to just to seal it and stripe it would make so much appeal when you first walk in for maybe five or six thousand dollars. We have our own striping machine. Yeah. I mean, we can stripe it, we just need to get the, the base coat. Here's I don't mean to take up any time. No, there, there's a church over on Balearic that just- They just did it. They yeah, just, they just did, finished that. They sealed right? it, they talking? striped it, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. makes an impression. Yeah. And it's this not much money, guys. A dream of mine, too. I think we need to, at some point, spend very little time, but I, I, I like to call it Operation Bootstrap. We've got villagers who are so disengaged. I mean, fighting and carping, and it would be nice, as I found, because I can be a carper, and being on a committee makes you like, well, heck, we gotta be more positive. <laughs> and possibly, if we could, I hear about people talking about bridges at Coronado that need painting. If the PO, I think it would be fun to organize an Operation Bootstrap and let neighborhoods take over the restroom cleaning on, or the restrooms on golf courses and maybe paint them and, you know, there's a bunch of people who Agreed. would love to be involved in these little things. And have a competition. Yeah. The bridge yeah. And paint, everybody can do a little bit of, you know, even the people who can't mo mobilize or can't paint. It's like, well, you can bring the people who do fruit or something, you know, just getting them involved in, in building that synergy, that yeah. sense of community. Well, well, we have, we have an item the short there term. to paint the Magellan bathroom for $3,000. I guarantee if we put a notice up there, yeah, it's yes. on our blue and green and yellow sheet. Yeah. Volunteers would do that in a It'd heartbeat if you just put a, a notice there and said we need a couple of volunteers yes. to paint the ladies' bathroom. They'd yes. do it in a heartbeat. Yes. The people it, they live well, there. We they want to keep draw it murals People are awesome <laughs> in the village. They, they but, give, give blood. I mean, when they have a, the blood banks, they love it when they come into the village. Well, I mean, they no. give constantly. Yeah, that's you go to Garvin Woodlands Garden. Yeah. Bunches of people are out at Garvin helping out, putting plants in the ground. The village people are wonderful. Yes, we yeah. just haven't tapped, we haven't, we haven't, 
like everybody, you just need to know what's needed. Sometimes you're just kind of sitting back, you want to help, but you don't really, really don't know how you can help. Well, in many ways, that help was discouraged for a while. Yeah, yeah very true. And we, we need to get back to those days. We, we need the support and we need the participation of the villagers. Uh, you know, John Paul and I spent a lot of time at, at the office and, and we're, we're looking at things and trying to figure out how to get things done without spending a lot of money. Um, and, you know, we, it's not easy to do. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to, to be totally disruptive to, to getting anything done right now, but we, we need you know, things from striping parking lots to, to painting and, and cleaning and, and if, we, if we could get uh, participation in neighborhoods, it, it would be very helpful in a lot of that. Now, John Paul has been successful in, in painting bridges stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and but we're, we're also planting some poison ivy down there that will help flavor on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to say yeah. something. Our problem is, is that if you haven't looked at the new financials that are coming out to the board, virtually every department is losing money in this organization. So we're subsidizing it with our dues and the pie just gets smaller and smaller, but our costs continue to increase but we're not focusing on how we can get more golfers here. Do we need to raise the price? We had 212,000 rounds last year, 216 and 18, but we blame the weather. But yet we spent almost $40 a round last year, or last year and just under 35, or 39.50 in 1918. And we're not even coming close to charging our members that, that kind of a rate. And, and we want cheap golf, but golf is consuming a lot of the budget, two million plus. And then right behind it's restaurants. But we actually subsidized restaurants more in, in 2018 than we did golf. Restaurants ate up about 45, you had to add 45 cents per dollar revenue for restaurants where golf was down below 40%. And, and so those are things that we need to look long term to figure out how we're going to go ahead and, and keep be main solvent and still have money capital to pave the roads as you can see the cracks are coming and it's just a matter of time before they deteriorate we have to replace the calm the the, uh, the culverts we've got probably 20 million dollars worth of culverts to replace before we can actually do road actual road and the list just goes on and on and on and and so i'm kind of frustrated because I just see all this money going out and we're focusing on today, but we're not looking next year, three years out, five years out, how are we going to achieve all this money? And when you look at the wish list from management, from previous management on deferred maintenance, it's mind boggling. There's about $35 million that this association needs to cover that whole list over the next 10 years. And that's a lot of money. We need to get the village people, the property owners, participating again. Not just in golf and 212,000 rounds compared to your time. You're looking at 360. 360, 340,000 rounds. At that point, you were looking at what's our capacity. And I figured our capacity was probably about 420,000 rounds total. I mean, that's about as good as you can do, pretty much. Uh, how do we, it's not just golf, it's tennis, it's going it's to the restaurants, it's everything. Somehow we got to get everybody back going again, like they used to. Well, and when you do that, then, but then I, everything gets a little bit better. But if we go to the zero-based budgeting, then that will give us a baseline of what it costs to, yes. to operate, to keep the Waypoint restaurant open, and whether it's worthwhile to spend a hundred dollars a day to bring in five dollars for coffee. And Which I'm not picking on the waypoint because they actually made money. Yeah. And, that, and that's kind of what we're deciding on the Discovery Center. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And and, and it, it's a tough has, decision. It's not an easy decision. Has to be decision. Looked at in that vein, right? Yes. Now, and, and unfortunately the over the, the years there's been a, a division of the POA versus all the, the 
property owners. And, but in reality, the property owners own the POA. They are the stockholders. They, they are the, the, the people that control everything that goes on here. It, it's, it's like, you know, Diamani is a, is a private country club, but the village is a private club. We, we are here, at, at all members of the same organization with the same responsibilities for what's going on. And so none of us can, sit, can really sit back and say, well, everybody else will take care of it, because we're all members of the same organization. And, and I, I think we're we starting to change in that. We see what John Paul is doing. We see what Lloyd is doing. We see what you're doing, Dan. And it encourages people like Kathy and like myself, and I would hope somebody like Blakeman, to get involved and to get end up. Yeah, it'd be nice just to go and play golf and retire and not do anything. But you see other people giving their time, and you say to yourself, "Well, shoot. Now maybe it's just one year, but I'll I'll do what I can for a year, and then I get to go play golf again." And I think there's a lot of people out there. And as far as the, I think we, because of the administer, the association was so non-responsive to the property owners. We got to the point where, I don't know, maybe, <coughs> where you don't want to go to a certain restaurant because of you're being abused by somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's got to come back again where we're, we're if we're going to buy gas, let's buy gas from somebody that's got a gas station in the village. Mm -hmm. Why not? Right. Uh, if we're going to go to a restaurant, let's go to some place in the village that's that can serve us. Uh, we yeah. have uh, gone a long time here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> let, let me. Uh, I mean, I'm having the same problem the ringleader has. <laughs> well, you're mostly dealing with the same guy. <laughs> we haven't even got started on it. <laughs> okay, the uh, uh, budget committee, we've asked the finance group to, to look at uh, the, the ad hoc budget committee report and see how we can uh, begin integrating those things into the, the operations. Uh, policies and procedures, finance policy is, is on hold for July, procurement is on hold for July. Uh, capitalization policy, did you bring one with you? I did. Uh, if, if we could pass that out and I'll get that. please take a look at this and we will, um, we will talk about it next week. We're not going to talk about it this week. Probably the most critical thing right now is our records retention schedule. Yes. It is, uh, it needs adjusting because we have some records that we need to be set to storage and some that need to be purged. And um, it, it, it's, it's all flight. So we're, we're looking at the records retention right now. Okay. So that's <coughs> down the road? Uh, records yeah. retention has to be quick. Yeah, I, we already have all of our shredding bins on site. Um, I haven't contacted them yet to come pick them up because I knew, you know, that was a policy that did need to kind of be reviewed first. Okay. But they are going to be calling me saying, when can I come get our stuff now? <laughs> are you, so. Do you have a recommendation? Does it need to come to the Finance Committee or, or can we rely on the AICPA or uh, the nonprofit, the National Nonprofit Association? We should probably also have a policy for the board that the board adopts on record re retention. We could, for right now, we can, if, if that is the policy we're going to use, then uh, that's fine, but you know, we need to make a recommendation to the board so okay. they can have a formal policy. Okay, so come up with something that we would like to go forward with and ask for a blessing on it? Right. Um, so you have the uh, you get, get a copy of the capitalization. It, look at it, and uh, I know that certain people in the room will have lots of comments next week. Yeah, we know that. At least two people in the room. <laughs> 
Uh, okay. Uh, depreciation policy, we still need some work on that. I've passed out the investment policy. Uh, if you would please take a look at that. Uh, you, you may not have. Uh, Does it start off with Treasury bills, notes, and bonds? It says the existing article, or the proposed? No, that's, no, that's the, the one proposed. that's on the website. Article 20 investment policy. Yeah. But there's two of those. There's the one that's on the website and then the one that yeah, this was is, sent out with the minutes. Yeah, this is the one that the committee was working on. And so it has all sorts of marks on it. Oh, this is the one. Yeah. 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 So um, since the the prior committee had put all the effort in, we, we probably want to start there and, and decide if we want to make any changes from there. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, other finance policies will will run as they, they come along. All right. We we talked about a lot. We covered a lot of ground. Not a lot of votes today, but that's okay. Um, we will. The is next Tuesday okay for everybody? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I I believe I won't start traveling until the following. Week. So um, I will. Uh, we have three operations opening up July first. So uh, they they like me to go and look at them. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, anything else? Yes. Sir. What's the status of our general manager? Are we looking for somebody? Is that on hold or? Uh, no, we're the board is actively looking. Uh, as I understand it, they've they've had a, almost 300 applications. 300 applications. That doesn't mean 300 qualified applications, but about 300 applications. You know, my question: If they got that many, are we paying too high? <laughs> I mean, to get 300 applications. Uh, that's actually there that's was no salary range stated in the in what was put out yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm probably getting out ahead of Diana a little bit but uh, we are in the final throes of um, the recruiter will be bringing us five people to interview for the board and we'll be doing that over the next two weeks we have an outside recruiter bringing them in or Pardon? You have no, an outside there, recruiter there are, there are Watch the YouTube the last the, the board yeah, meets yeah. work session. And yeah, there are they two, explained it real well. Two villagers who uh, volunteered to do it. They're they are professional recruiters. They've been heavily involved and Great. still active to, in some ways. Saved us about fifty thousand yeah, dollars. That, that, that's what I was. <laughs> we pay fifty thousand dollars to somebody. To, yeah, we okay. we uh, but they they used all the same resources Super. and. Reached out uh, and and got no very good response. John, no, I'm good. Oh, okay. uh, did you want to say whether you were applying or? Oh, you want me to re repeat what I said? <laughs> yeah, he, he <laughs> said it wasn't him. <laughs> Nor am I considered. I read his statement. He said it's not me. <laughs> uh, but you know, we we will. Uh, you know, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll have some answers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is, is there a job description? Uh, there should be one. There is a job description. I think on uh, Mike Lincoln. And Mike, uh, I, know, I know that the the entire thing was posted out on Indeed.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be able to find it out there. Uh, we're down to, I believe, interviews next week with the board. I think that's what we're trying to set up right now for the five finalists, if you will, <laughs> to be yeah. interviewed directly by the board. Especially in our group with strategies and all that, I would think at some point we'd want to get him in, involved early on. Yeah. Him, him or her. Yeah. yeah. They are her. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, you got to be politically correct everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. You do. Gosh, I'm sorry, Terrible Kathy. Life. Mm -hmm. I was a <laughs> uh, I'd like to have uh, about five minutes next week on the agenda. I've gone back through uh, the auditor's uh, reports that are posted online for 2016 and I've crunched a little bit of history on their return per dollar 
spent uh, for each of the major uh, major departments that we have in the village. It's uh, interesting when you look at it. But the, the point of doing that, may, it may also be something we may want to consider to be a measurable metric going forward for every dollar spent. Here's our history on what kind of return we've gotten from that dollar and because during the course of the year, your overall dollars are going to move up and down. But what's the actual return per dollar spent doing? And you can measure improvement or disimprovement that way. So, okay. you know, just something I can share. All right. Uh, David, did you have anything you wanted to add? I do not. I do not. You're going to present the financial report tomorrow at the board? No, I thought Karina was. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm sick tomorrow. <laughs> no, I, I, will I think That's she's calling in sick. <laughs> it's I too did, early to do that. I did do a very preliminary cash flow projection to the end of the year. We need to talk about that and see if we can. It, yeah. it looks good, but we need to make sure we have our capital in there, our capital purchase. Yeah, we, uh, we have. Uh, based on a, what should be a reasonable uh, estimate of revenues, we're, you know, we, we should be okay, but, but that assumes everything is good. Yeah. And so that's, uh, we, we can't naturally assume all that at this point. Uh, I, I would hope that the do, new general manager would be a finance guy. Not a guy necessarily. It's a <laughs> individual. <laughs> but somebody, oh yeah, that's what we need. We need a finance uh, guy. Finance, golfer, tennis player. Football well, guy. Okay. <laughs> Billionaire. Personable, smart. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. All right. Somebody all maybe around. wears all glasses. Five, five star <laughs> player. Well, I'm a marketing person by nature. You look like a finance guy to me. <laughs> Uh, Second, well rounded. What are you trying to say, Butch? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't hurt to, you know, if, if we could find somebody in the village, how blessed would we be We'd to be find a blessed. general manager from the village? Do you need a motion? You know what you think you, when you do that? You know what <laughs> you need. Okay. <laughs> the learning curve. Karina, did you have anything you wanted to add? You don't have a learning curve. Yeah. I'd love uh, to. <laughs> thank you for having me, and I look forward to being able to help. Make some contributions. We're glad and, you're and here. Kind of closing the gaps and, and, and so forth. And yeah, Karina is formally a member of this committee, so uh, you know she she takes uh, the seat that Liz had before. Uh, Liz was the secretary. Uh huh. But Kathy is now the secretary. Temporary. Which may last until you get these minutes, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Uh, I mean, with that, one thought. Motion to adjourn. Oh, I, I can ask. No, no this was ahead. just. Did anybody else? Uh, I don't know who would talk to to the sales agency or the marketing, but if there are web pages for people leaving red states or states that are burning, I think we need to hop on that in some fashion. I mean, they may be aware of it already, but to me, it's like, oh God, that's like yeah. a carrot dangling. Well, the, so, I know that the agency is aware of that. Yeah, we'll okay. make sure tomorrow. Yeah. Super. Thank you. All right. Okay. We have a motion to adjourn. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.